Welcome to our service tonight, a celebration of Bedford Day. My name is Neil Vandry and I'm your officiator here, and we will be live streaming from Florida. On this day in 1967, James Bedford became the first person to be cryonically suspended and has remained in suspension at Alcor. And we have a wonderful presentation tonight with Ben Best. If this is your first time joining us here at Perpetual Life, I'd like to invite you to join our emailing list so that you can get updates on all that is going on with super longevity so you may live longer and a healthier life. You can join our email simply by emailing me through our website at perpetual.life. Our service this month later will be on Thursday, January 27th, and we will have Lincoln Cannon from the Mormon Transhumanist Association giving a talk. So join our Zoom party at 6 p.m. The live stream will be at 7 p.m. Eastern time. I'd like to recite our creed, our creed as we believe that all of life is sacred and that we have been given this one life to make unlimited. We believe in our creator's divine plan for all of humanity to have infinite lifespans in perfect health and eternal joy, rendering death to be optional. By following our gospels, we achieve eternal life, creating a heaven here on earth. We follow Nikolai Fedorov, who taught that the transcendence of the creator will only be solved when humanity, in our unified efforts, become an instrument of universal resuscitation, when the divine word becomes our divine action. And we follow Arthur C. Clarke, who said, the only way to discover the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. And so we enter each day energized in spirit and empowered by the words of our prophets to live in joy, serving our creator and all of humanity forever and ever. Now this evening, we are pleased to share with you about another movie that has been made on Life Extension. This documentary has been traveling the world at different film festivals and just has become available in the past couple of days to be seen here in the USA. This documentary was partially filmed right here in our church at Perpetual Life called Artificial Immortality. We're thrilled to be part of this featured documentary. It explores the latest technological advancements in AI, robotics, and biotech as it explores the essence of being human and whether it can be replicated. You can get this now, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to actually stream it, but at the moment, you need to actually purchase the DVD or another way to watch it. Uh, it's not streaming at the moment, but it is available finally here in the US. AI, artificial immortality. And we will, of course, have this film as a movie night at the church in the near future. Another friend of ours that's in that film is uh, Martin Rothblatt, Ben Gertzel, and some others. It's, it's a terrific piece. Our mission here at Perpetual Life is to assist all people in the radical extension of healthy human life. And we provide fellowship and uh, for longevity enthusiasts at our regular services. We have invited guests, and in the future, we'll have other guests that will teach scientific rationality along with the creator's plan that humanity evolve to achieve markedly extended, healthy human lifespans. The church, this church of perpetual life is a science and faith-based transhumanist church. Our faith is in the creator and in humanity to find ways toward healthy, unlimited lifespans. At this time, all of our services are still virtual and we'll let you know when we are meeting in person again in South Florida. Once we do start to meet in person, we will still have these wonderful Zoom parties, presentations, and live streams. It will still be part of our events. Our live stream tonight is being recorded and will be available after we close. You can find it in our YouTube channel, and there's a link always at the top of our website at perpetual.life, where you can easily connect to the recording of this service and previous services. And you'll also be able to always find at the top of our website, the place to register for future events. So please share the recording of this event with all of the people that you care about and 
be sure to join us also later this month for our regular service on January 27th. Let me introduce now our speaker tonight, Ben Best. In our event tonight is in remembrance of the biotechnology self-experimenter James Bedford, who on January 12th, 2022, will have been cryonically preserved for 55 years. Ben Best will discuss biotechnology, infectivity, and epidemiol epi epidemiology issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Ben Best is a professional health science journalist, and his education includes, de includes degrees in pharmacy, physics, and computing sciences. Please help me to welcome Ben Best. Take it away, Ben. Um, so uh, this is uh, all in remembrance of uh, James Bedford, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the epidemiology and molecular biology, starting with epidemiology of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, but at very at the very first, we need to acknowledge uh, James Bedford himself. Uh, so uh, there he is, as a young man, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, he's been in liquidation for 55 years. There he is as an older man, uh, more closely close to the time that he was cryopreserved at the age of 73, uh, uh, dying of cancer. And uh, he's uh, been stored by Alcor. Uh, he's currently being stored by Alcor. He didn't always uh, be there, but anyway, that's where he is now. So um, with that acknowledgement, uh, I'm gonna proceed with talking about uh, COVID-19. Um, just to say what it is, it's a disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it's a, which is a single strand of RNA, uh, ribonucleic acid. And uh, the, uh, the virus enters cells, it takes over the cell machinery to manufacture virus. Uh, it's got a spike protein. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the spikes with two components, the S1 part that binds uh, to the cell and the S2 part that fuses to the cell. That it's infecting, and um, the ACE2 receptor is what it, what the receptor binding domain of S1 binds to. So, I mean, in 2002, 2003, you've heard of the SARS virus or SARS-CoV virus, uh, but then it was in December 2019 that the that the current SARS-CoV-2 virus emerged from Wuhan, China. Uh, it differs from the original SARS in a number of ways. One of which is it binds to the ACE2 receptor 10 to 20 times more affinity than the SARS-CoV, and that makes it much more infective. There's other differences as well, um, but I won't go into them at the moment. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the disease sequence is the first thing is you inhale the virus-laden aerosols, and then uh, it uh, rapidly rep replicates in the cells of the, of the lungs, and then there's an inflammatory response. That's the most damaging response. It's called a cytokine storm. That's what, that's what really causes the most harm to people. So there's the sequence, uh, inflammatory signals coming out of these uh, immune cells leading to cytokine storms and ultimately multi-organ failure and, and um, acute uh, respiratory disease syndrome, ARDS. Anyway, um, so cytokine storm. Anyway, symptoms. Um, so most, one third of cases, no symptoms. And uh, of those who have symptoms, 80% are mild. Now, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about is based on pre-Omicron. So the, the top symptom for all the other variants of uh, COVID-19 was fever. And so people were measuring people's fever all the time to, to make sure they didn't have COVID. But uh, Omicron doesn't give fever. It's not one of the symptoms. So uh, we have one less, uh, one less tool to use against, uh, against the Omicron variant. Anyway, and this is pre, also pre-Omicron. Um, so we, yeah, I don't have data, data for Omicron, but anyway, the 45% um, of people died of respiratory failure. The next largest cause, 30% uh, uh, was, um, by uh, septic shock and pulmonary embolism and ischemic stroke. Well, I, it, 
cardiac arrest. Anyway, um, the, compared to the other serious viruses we've seen in the last few decades, uh, SARS-CoV-2 isn't isn't uh, as fatal. Uh, only two to three percent. You can see, I don't know, HIV was it was killing an eighty to ninety percent. Ebola, uh, you know, more than fifty percent, and and uh, even the SARS-CoV ten percent. So, uh, but um, it's uh, SARS-CoV two has killed a lot more people because uh, it's so infective, and the the other ones uh, were were killing people but not spreading, and that makes a difference. Um, so uh, a little epidemiology first. Uh, aging of the immune system explains the, much much of the reason why why elder, older people uh, die at a much more uh, a greater uh, rate. Uh, as, as I say here, uh, compared to people 18 to 29, the death risk is 200 times greater for those 75 to 84, and 630 times greater than uh, for those over age 85. And uh, being male uh, is a hazard too. Uh, they, uh, they, depending on the variant and so forth, the, the, the male deaths account for 59 to 75% of the deaths. Men smoke and drink alcohol more than women. They have a higher neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio than women. I'm not gonna explain that, but, but also interferon is, is, a, is a major defense we have against viruses. And, and uh, women seem to, to have, uh, 10 times greater interferon than men do. So uh, anyway, obesity is also a big risk factor. Uh, every unit of increase in BMI, um, um, the uh, measure of obesity is associated with 12% increase severe uh, uh, COVID-19. And abdominal obesity is, is more associated with serious COVID-19 symptoms than, than BMI. And um, Body mass index is what BMI stands for. So it's, it's basically, anyway, it's, a, it's measuring your, anyway. St anyway, uh, people staying at home uh, uh, may worsen obesity because they exercise less and eat more. <laughs> anyway, um, the COVID, uh, back to the virus, uh, the, the spike protein, because that's the mean by, means by which the COVID-19 virus gets into cells. It attaches to the ACE2 um, enzyme receptor on lung cells. Uh, now, antigens are substances that are found on bacteria and cause immune response. So, so our, our body reacts to antigens, and uh, and the spike on the on the vi primary virus uh, is, is what the primary uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, antigen is, and uh, that's the target of the vaccines, they're trying to get the spike antigen. And um, all, all of the SARS-CoV-2 variants involve modifications of the protein, spike protein, although there are other, other um, modifications. So here's, uh, you've seen probably maybe a lot of depictions of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and all those spikes uh, surrounding it, which it uses to attach to the, to the uh, ACE2 receptor. So, um, uh, the S1, the S1 part of the spike uh, is the outer part. It, that's what attaches to the cell, and the S2 is what fuses to the cell membrane. So that's a more detailed picture of it. There's ACE2 receptor on the host, and then there's the uh, um, receptor binding domain on the S1 part of the spike, and then the S2 part is uh, what uh, fuses with the cell membrane. So that's another, just another depiction of, of ACE2 attaching to, uh, to the um, S1 uh, receptor binding to me. And, uh, but there's another player in this uh, required for fusion, and that's uh, the Tempur SS2 enzyme. So the, the ACE1, ACE2 is the way the virus attaches to the cell, but the Tempur SS2 is the way the virus gets into the cell. Um, so we show that in more detail here. What happens is the the uh, the um, <clears throat> the ACE, okay the S one is attaching to to the ACE two receptor on the on the lung cell, say, and then the um, 
the uh, temper SS2 cuts the spike. So that makes the, uh, the S1 subunit is released. And then the S2 can fuse to the host cell membrane and, and fuse the, the viral virus to the host cell membrane. So that's the process. So that's a sort of a big picture kind of view is the same sort of thing showing the showing the uh, temporary SS2 cutting the spike protein and uh, allowing for fusion. And uh, uh, just another another uh, picture of the same thing. Uh, you never can have too many pictures of some of these events. Anyway, what do we have an ACE2 enzyme for? I mean, it's not just there to, to, to let COVID get into our body um, or cause a, causes disease or SARS-CoV-2 virus. Anyway, the ACE2 actually pr pr protects against excessive ACE activity. So we have an ACE enzyme that uh, uh, converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and that constricts blood vessels and raises blood pressure. So we don't want too much of that. We don't want blood pressure to get too high. We do have, need to have blood pressure. Uh, that's a useful thing to have, um, but anyway, it, we don't want it too high. And the ACE2 uh, enzyme normally, when it's not uh, helping out the, the um, SARS virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, it's, uh, it's cutting the uh, angiotensin 2 or converting it into angiotensin 1-7, which actually dilates blood vessels and lowers blood pressure. So I guess if we're getting too much ACE2 blocked by the virus, we'd get too much ACE activity, which ra would raise blood pressure. So what is uh, so okay? We, we asked about ACE2. Why do we have that? What about temporary SS2? Why do we have that? And the answer is we just don't know. When we get rid of it in mice, they, they appear to be normal. So maybe attacking uh, temporary SS2 uh, is the way to go. Uh, but uh, it's not not uh, not being used in a widespread uh, application. Anyway, ACE2 the ACE2 declines with age. And it's also reduced by diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So that sounds great. Uh, although uh, you, you end up with increased blood pressure, but on the other hand, uh, you, you'd have fewer virus receptors. Well, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't, because uh, only, you only need tiny amounts of, of ACE2 for the, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus to get into cells. Uh, it, as long as temporary SS2 is present, the uh, the um, virus can get it, get into the cells. It, so the decline, it's raising blood pressure and it's not helping you, protecting you against SARS-CoV-2. Um, but there's another way that SARS-CoV-2 gets into cells and that's by uh, in being engulfed by endosomes, which are sort of like uh, little packets of, anyway, they carry things from outside of the cell inside. And once the inside the cell, the spike protein is cleaved by this enzyme and but that requires acidification. Now, hydroxychloroquine uh, is a substance that can inhibit the acidification. So, uh, so that would that would block this this uh, um, the effect of the, the the spike protein from being cleaved properly. But on the other hand, the um, it's seen in the lab. Endosome entry is seen in the lab, but uh, temper SS two is a ray is the way COVID basically gets in the cell. So uh, hydroxychloroquine is just not effective because it doesn't, doesn't address the real issue, which is temporary SS2, which is, which is the real source of the problem. So anyway, that, that's just a depiction of the, uh, this uh, endosome entry. Uh, the whole, whole virus gets swallowed and in, into an endosome. And then, then this capsin L2 uh, cuts off the, uh, cuts the virus apart anyway. And allows the the RNA to get in the cell, but um, um, and but that requires acidification, and uh, and the hydroxychloroquine could uh, could uh, counter that, but uh, it doesn't work because this is a this isn't the usual process. Now, how to you know after after the virus is in the cells, then it takes over and st and just turns all the machinery into making more viruses, and uh, and um, then the the virus. It gets spit out the uh, the uh, in fact the new viruses that have been created in the cell. So this shows the whole process. On the left we see a, an infected cell and and uh, and it's uh, and then the the release of new viruses, which on the right is infecting a new cell. 
uh, by mostly the Temper SS2 entry, uh, but it, it also depicts the uh, endocytosis entry. Anyway, um, the first uh, variant of SARS-CoV-2 that, that was saw was uh, very early on in the disease process uh, was uh, D614G, and that happened in January 2020. Uh, and it, uh, it improved the S1 uh, receptor binding domain ability to uh, bind to the ACE2 receptor. Uh, and it, so that increases in trans, it increased trans, transmissibility, but it, it didn't increase COVID-19 severity. And so it, it soon, it replaced the Wuhan strain uh, very quickly. Uh, all the current variants incorporate the D614G mutation. So that shows you how it took over. It just sort of appeared in late January of 2020. And, and by the end of June, everything was D14G uh, variant. So we don't talk about that variant anymore because that's the only variant there is basically. Um, so a few other variants, uh, all these variants are have uh, uh, <clears throat> the subsequent to D14G, they, they all seem to have some modification of the spike proteins. Uh, and we got alpha appearing in October 2020 in Delta and beta. Um, anyway, uh, beta didn't really get that very far and neither did gamma. Uh, basically in 2021, alpha was the, was the, uh, um, was the biggest, most dominant form uh, in, in April. And, but by August uh, and June and August, the summer delta took over. Uh, in 2021, and um, they both increased the, uh, both those two variants increased the infectivity by modifications on the receptor binding domain, and, but uh, um, Delta's, Delta's receptor binding domain was also better able to avoid the immune system, so that gave it, that gave it its extra advantage over alpha and gamma and beta. Anyway, uh, you can look at the, these, uh, the, you can, as you can see by the chart here, the delta delta has the highest infectivity of, of the three those, these three variants: alpha, gamma, and delta. Uh, and uh, it's not much more lethal. So the infectivity was the big advantage delta had. So you can look. Here's an antigenic map which shows how it's just showing the Wuhan strain, which is uh, and uh, all the vaccines. Uh, and anyway, this. The, this antigenic map shows how how different, uh, as far as antigen is concerned, uh, the the, uh, the different strains are from the original Wuhan strain. Uh, so the further away that they are, the, the more distant. And beta was the most far away. And um, all our current vaccines, though, were uh, developed against the D614 variant of the Wuhan strain. So that makes you think that. Well, the further away the antigen is from the Wuhan D14 variant of the Wuhan strain, uh, the more less effective the, the vaccine might be. So let's talk about the vaccines for a moment. Uh, the mRNA, uh, the mRNA vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna, uh, they have liposomes. This is the way they're delivering it. Uh, and they're just like lipid bilayers. And they can, and, and they use uh, polyethylene glycol uh, on on the surface to protect it, to keep the immune system from attacking these liposomes. So the liposomes will attach them, use the uh, the membranes, and then release the uh, the mr the modified mRNAs uh, that that are created for the uh, vaccine. For the uh, anyway. Um, so that's just another depiction of the same thing. You have the mRNA vaccine uh, attaching and, and releasing itself. And, and then they, what happens is the, the, uh, the mRNA uh, or start manufacturing spike proteins, which end up being on the cell surface and then allowing our immune system to see these spikes and react to it uh, without having to react to the spikes by, by having them be on viruses. So that's that's how they it protects us. And so we're getting the spike antigen without without the uh, virus. So um, um, I guess this is sort of the same thing. The the uh, showing just a different picture, showing the same thing as the last one. 
And uh, AstraZeneca has a little different strategy. They they um, use a weakened chimpanzee adenovirus. That's a sort of like a cold virus to deliver uh, genes DNA that that include the virus spike protein to get the immune response. It's less effective than the mRNA vaccines. Uh, uh, it's, it says here uh, two doses of, of the AstraZeneca vaccine is 75% uh, against uh, effective against alpha and 69% against effective against delta. So there is the China uh, coronavac vaccine. They're just basically using an inactivated virus with a chemical that uh, that prevents the DNA, that kills the DNA, and then they just inject the inject the virus into the into the patient. Now the Sputnik V from uh, Russia actually uses two different adenoviruses. Uh, it's 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 actually very effective against symptoms, very effective against uh, severe disease, but uh, the, the regulators have a lot of concern over these adenoviruses, these two different adenoviruses. You know what? I mean, the, the treatment may be worse than a disease, but well, that's their concern anyway. The, the European EU will not allow um, Russians in, into, the, into Europe uh, because they're not protected by an authorized vaccine. So uh, actually AstraZeneca has been, has been the, the one used most worldwide. And then China's coronavirus has, is the next most uh, frequently used vaccine. And then there's Pfizer BioNTech and Sinopharm, another uh, uh, another Chinese vaccine with the same te uh, same technology. And then there's Moderna, Moderna, Johnson Johnson, Sputnik V. Uh, so and nearly 60% of the world's population has gotten at least one dose of the vaccine by January uh, 2022. So um, what about the vaccine side effects compared to placebo? Well, uh, you're, you're 4.36 times as likely to have local pain, 3.06 uh, likely to have, uh, compared to placebo, uh, likely to have fatigue and uh, 2.95 uh, fever and so forth. Uh, these will vary from variant to variant, of course. Um, anyway, that's, that's just an, and then, Frequency of anaphylactic shock, that's the most serious reaction you can get, anaphylactic shock. And it's highest with, with Pfizer and, uh, and uh, then less, less with AstraZeneca and Moderna. It's, it's really an extreme uh, immune response. It can be life-threatening. Uh, but uh, if you give epinephrine, you can, you can uh, protect against it. So when you go for your vaccination, they ask you to wait 15 minutes uh, so that if you do go in it, uh, anaphylactic shock they can they can administer the epinephrine so um, um so from december 2020 when they started giving vaccinations until october 2021 they collected these uh, all, statistics on all these primary vaccinations anyway it's over a million well over a million so uh, 18 18 uh, 18 out of uh, 10,000 people who got these primary vaccinations ended up getting COVID-19 anyway. Uh, 1.5 uh, per 10,000 had severe outcome and 0 0.3 per 10,000 died. Uh, but all of the persons with a severe outcome had at least one risk factor and 77.8% of the people who died had four or more risk factors. Uh, and there's no deaths among those who received additional vaccine. So the risk factors uh, they're talking about is diabetes, immunosuppressant, or chronic disease of the kidney, heart, liver, lung, or nervous system. So um, as far as effectiveness against symptoms, uh, Moderna is the most effective against, uh, looks like all of the variants. I've got alpha, delta, beta, gamma, and mu up there. And then uh, once again, I'm showing this uh, antigenic distance. and uh, um, it's uh, against Delta, uh, two doses of uh, Pfizer's vaccine is 86% uh, effective, uh, but only 80% effective against the beta variant. So that's just an indication of, of uh, antigenic distance and effect on vaccine effectiveness. So how about hospitalization and death? Um, um, actually, Pfizer prevents hospitalization and death more effectively than the others, other vaccines. Um, now, 
uh, all the vaccines decline in effectiveness with time. So this is showing days after after your dose, and it shows a decline in effectiveness. Moderna seems to decline at the slowest rate. That's the dark blue bar. Uh, bar. Uh, at 100, 200 days, it's uh, it's gone down to about seventy um, percent, whereas the uh, the lighter blue is uh, Pfizer, uh, and uh, and then we have the um, <clears throat> the Johnson and Johnson and and AstraZeneca, which aren't very effective in the first place, and and also decline quite a bit uh, uh, as time goes on. So uh, combining vaccines, uh, one dose of of uh, AstraZeneca followed by uh, one Pfizer mRNA uh, gives you double the T cell response uh, uh, as the fi two Pfizer vaccines. So uh, there's an advantage to combining them and repeated doses of AstraZeneca doesn't become increasingly less effective, but repeated doses of the mRNA vaccines, Moderna and, and Pfizer uh, um, do not become less effective. Now the boosters, uh, the third dose, the boost, what they're calling is for Pfizer, the third dose uh, is uh, given to pe persons over age 60. 60, uh, the infection rate was 11.3 times lower and the, uh, the rate of serious disease was 19.5 times lower compared to not giving a booster. And then uh, another study, participants who'd received a booster five months after the second dose had 90% fewer deaths. So it just shows the effectiveness of the booster. Basically, it's showing also the, the decline in in uh, the decline in effectiveness over time. It doesn't show the exact time units here, but anyway. And then giving a booster uh, makes the effectiveness go back up again. So, um, um, as I say, all the vaccines were developed against the the Wuhan D fourteen G um, uh, variant. And so uh, um, not the Delta or Omicron or any of the newer variants. So you can't expect to be quite as effective. Uh, a fully vaccinated person, which means two doses of Pfizer, 24.3% um, uh, effective against, against uh, Delta and, and only 50%, 51.4% effective against um, Omicron. So, uh, but uh, the, a third dose of the mRNA vaccine will cut down the infectiveness of Omicron to uh, to 10.7%. Uh, um, so uh, Omicron, it's it's 3.2 times more transmissible than Delta. It replicates more in the bronchus, whereas Delta replicates more in the lungs. Um, and and greater replication in the bronchus. Bronchus is above the lungs. It's a higher Higher in your in your uh, in your uh, in the respiratory tract. So uh, if you're speaking or breathing or singing or shouting or whatever, you're shooting out more um, more viruses from your bronchi than would be the case uh, if it's uh, replicating in the in the lungs, which is what Delta does. So that's part of the reason why uh, Omicron is more infective. Uh, part of the reason, the other part, another part being that. Uh, a, a better, uh, a better, um, anyway, a, a better spike protein. Anyway, uh, comparing Omicron and Delta, <clears throat> so with uh, hospitalizations with Delta, about 43% to get hospitalized who are infected. And uh, whereas uh, it's only 14.7% with Omicron. And with deaths, it's even, the advantage is uh, more, even more clearly with Delta, 5.3%. And uh, Omicron only 0.8 percent, but Omicron, it, almost all the COVID-19 infections in the United States now are Omicron, and uh, so and hospitalizations that are all-time high. So even though <clears throat> Omicron, the rate of hospitalization is lower, Omicron is great is so infective, it's infecting so many people that uh, <clears throat> that. Uh, the hospitalizations are, have gone up. It's it's really it's really it, it, it's <clears throat> really a, there's many scientists who, who think uh, it's futile to try to even fight Omicron because everybody's going to infect get infected. So you should might as well expect to be infected. And there's some advantage actually 
uh, if you're infected by Omicron, it increases your immunity against Delta 4.4 fold. So, um, so there's a real, uh, Delta has, I mean, Omicron is, is actually nature's way of protecting us against Delta and some of these other variants. So it's a really a, a, a blessing in disguise, or I don't know what the size, but uh, <clears throat> a, a lot of people are arguing that fighting, trying to fight Omicron is, 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 is not only futile, but counterproductive. Anyway, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, I've gotten through this in 45 minutes. So does anybody have any questions? Yes, Ben, thank you. Thank you for your presentation on this. And uh, we have a couple of questions. And uh, anyone in the Zoom, I'd like to invite you to, to jump in and ask your questions in person. Anyone in the live stream, if you're live streaming, you can ask your questions in the chat box at the bottom. And I'll uh, bring those questions to Ben. I have one question here from Stephen, Ben. And uh, he's wondering if you know, has there been any COVID-19 related cryonic suspensions so far? Are you aware of any? I'm not, I'm not. Okay. That doesn't mean there isn't any, but I, I'm not aware. Right, I'm not either. But you know, many people who are put into cryonic suspension are private about that. and. The details about that are surrounding their suspensions would not be something that would well, be. Made. Remember also that of infectivity, you know, that there's a very low, you know, 0.8 percent of, of of people were actually dying of COVID. You know, there's a lot of hospitalizations and some people, you know, one third of cases there's no symptoms at all. You know, and we don't. It might even be more than that because if they're asymptomatic, who knows? Uh, so. Um, uh, but uh, COVID really is not that, it's not that lethal. It's only, as I say, the elderly. And of course, uh, many of the people who sign up for cryonics are elderly. And uh, so, um, but uh, so far, none of our, our elderly cryonics people have seemed to have taken care of themselves. <laughs> as far yes. as I can see. Yes. Ben, there's a question from David regarding long COVID. If, have you got any comments uh, about long COVID? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I have to admit, I haven't, haven't studied it. I, I haven't studied it very carefully. And, you know, the long COVID is where, you know, people have, people get COVID and then it's not like they get cured. You know, they have symptoms that, that, that drag on and on. It, you know, it, if you get certain organ, if you get certain organ systems, being damaged in one way or another, uh, you know, the ACE2 receptors aren't just on the lungs. That's how COVID gets into your body. But you've got ACE2 receptors on the kidney and the, and the intestine and, and the heart. And, and if these organs become damaged, uh, uh, you know, even if you're cured of the COVID, you get rid of the, you get, you get rid of the virus, um, the damage is going to be sustained. It's going to go on. So, um, uh, so that there's there's extended damage. I don't know. There may be more to long COVID than that, but any damage done uh, during the disease process itself, the is, is uh, damage done to organs is is probably going to be sustained and uh, not something you can cure or do something about. Yes, I believe we've got Jose with us now. Uh, yes. Um, hello, Ben. Um, great presentation, a very nice summary, and you covered many, many things. So um, it's very good. And I have a question about uh, messenger RNA vaccines. I actually, I am a big fan of this new technology that finally has begun working. And um, to me, it is really incredible. They were developed uh, just in days after having the sequence of the virus that was sent from China via email, which is also incredible. And then the whole planet has been vaccinated with a close to 10 billion vaccines by now, uh, which was never expected to happen. So my, my question number one is, what do you think about this new technology in general and for COVID? And the second part is because in my book, The Death of Death, that just came out in Turkish and next month comes out in Chinese for the Chinese New Year. 
I talk and it's written uh, that we will use uh, vaccines to cure cancer, to cure malaria and to cure HIV. And for what I have read from Moderna and um, BioNTech and Pfizer working on a messenger RNA vaccines, they say they should have vaccines exactly for those three uh, diseases, malaria, uh, HIV, and uh, cancer. So um, those are my two big questions for you, please. Well, those aren't questions, they're statements. I don't see a question in there. Well, if you agree, <laughs> or what do you think about uh, messenger RNA vaccines? <clears throat> yeah, I, I'd like to, <clears throat> I'm, I'm very, I'm pretty optimistic about what they can do. I'm, I'm a bit concerned. I mean, I also saw cytomegalovirus is, is part of the reason why elderly people uh, have such weak immune systems, uh, aside from just the fact that the, the immune system declines with age. And uh, unfortunately, cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus, they tend to hide in your cells and not be really readily accessible. And that's the, and, and, uh, and with cytomegalovirus, it just, it just drains your immune, exhausts your immune system, basically over your lifetime, makes you very vulnerable to, to COVID-19. And I would, I would, I, I've heard, I've read something, you know, there's some hope of, of working on, on mRNA vaccines against cytomegalovirus, uh, but uh, you know, how, how are they going to get them? How are they going to get them into the, the, the places they're hiding? Uh, the cytomegalovirus is hiding in the body. Uh, that's a that's a problem, uh, you know, because it, it can be dormant for you know for years and be activated, and it's always act. You know, it's just a it's a, it's a hard problem. I'd really like to see that one. As far as cancer, well, yeah, immunotherapy is is good for therapy. That's that's personalized medicine. You know, every cancer isn't just one disease. There's there's a, you know mutations upon mutations. So really, you have to. It, it's, it, it seems like that would be real, a ch real challenge. You'd have to, uh, you have to make a biopsy of everybody's cancer and see what the antigens are for that one and then create an mRNA vaccine against that cancer, which would be very, very challenging. Uh, I mean, we're not, <laughs> that would be, you know, the technology, the automation of developing mRNA vaccines would need to be very, very, very fast. And I'm sure in the, in maybe 30 years or 40 years or 50 years, uh, they'll have that technology to, to be able to develop these mRNA vaccines specific to some, uh, some cancer uh, antigens, but uh, I don't see it happening uh, really quickly. Jose, thank you for your statements and your questions and interaction. I appreciate that. We have another question for you from Joe, Ben. Let's bring Joe up, that's uh, Jay Cryon. Um, Hi, Ben, and hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Ben, for that really um, interesting and uh, in-depth discussion. I actually have three questions. Um, one, you mentioned something about it being uh, effect affecting generally old people, which largely is the case, but I don't want to belittle the younger people. I mean, my, my cousin actually just died last week. She's 55 years old. Um, she did not have a vaccine. Uh, so um, it does affect, in fact, out of the, I know eight, seven people who've died and um, four of them were actually younger. So, you know, yes, there are smaller numbers, but still uh, pretty severe when it happens. Um, but as to my questions, uh, as far as long COVID, I mean, there's a possibility that I have it. I have certain symptoms that I've had um, long after having had COVID, two years after. And there has been a lot of talk that the virus itself may reside uh, some people think in the brainstem or other places. And I wondered if you have any thoughts or knowledge of it being like, you know, Epstein-Barr or herpes in, in the way where it becomes dormant and then can be reactivated and what the possibilities are for that with regard to long COVID and other people. I mean, I know you said you don't have a lot of information on long COVID, but, you know, in this aspect of it. And the second question that I have, you mentioned about... Well, let's do one question at a time. Uh, okay. The... the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the I don't know. I don't. I, I haven't. I, you know. I've studied this subject fairly thoroughly, and and I I don't see any indication that it's like cytomegalovirus or Epstein Barr Epstein Barr virus in terms of hiding uh, in in different uh, tissues. And I really think. And I really think it's 
you know, it, COVID does do a lot of tissue damage, and, and I don't see I don't see the vi the virus. I mean, you, you're not getting a cytokine storm. Uh, you know, it's it's not like <clears throat> it's not like that. You're the, the 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 virus is coming back and giving you a cytokine storm. That's not happening. It's not it's not causing repeated damage in that way. Uh, and so I really think what's happening in long COVID is that tissues are being damaged. And that, you know, I mean, the body has some repair. I mean, if you, if you, uh, if you cut your finger or something, your body has some healing mechanism. It's not perfect. You know, there might be fibers, uh, fiber formation or so forth. Uh, and, and so there's some, body has some healing capacity for damage done to tissues. But I think that the, I, I think it's, it's limited. It's not, the body isn't perfect in terms of repairing all, all damage. I appreciate that, and that could indeed be the case, and I guess that's what's going to be studied over the next many years. It still is a, still a long way from knowing and understanding it. I mean, how long did it take with AIDS, which you brought up, 20 years or more before we really had a good understanding? Um, the other question was about blood pressure. You mentioned something about blood pressure possibly rising, and I wasn't clear on if that was with one of the treatments that you were talking about, that that was a potential side effect, or if that was a potential side effect of COVID or an effect of COVID uh, or could be an effect of COVID? Well, once again, <clears throat> we've got our ACE enzyme slash receptors, uh, which, <clears throat> um, which are what, which raises blood pressure. We need to have good blood pressure in order to have good circulation. So, so we need our ACE receptors, but then we don't want this getting out of hand. So we have our ACE2 receptors or enzymes and, and that sort of acts as a counterbalance to the ACE receptors to keep blood pressure, blood pressure from getting too high. But as people get older, they get, the, the ACE2 receptors tend to dominate over the, I mean, the, over the ACE, or the ACE receptors tend to dominate over the ACE, wait a minute, ACE, ACE2 receptors, um, um, the ACE2 receptors, um, decline with age, and, and 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 with age and with cardiovascular disease, and as the ACE2 receptors decline with age, blood pressure goes up with age. But so, and also the viruses are occupying the ACE2 receptors. So uh, when that happens, uh, you have less ACE2 receptors to counteract be counteracting the effect of the ACE receptors. So the, both these effects are, are making blood pressure go up. I'm still not clear on whether or not co this the COVID um, virus. Yeah, the virus. If the virus is occupying a receptor that lowers blood pressure, uh -huh. blood pressure is going to go up. I see. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Yes, thank you, Joe. Thank you for participating in this. I have another question for you, Ben, from one of our uh, guests here, and it's uh, from David. After getting boosted, his wife and he noticed pain in their joints of the bones uh, where they've had problems in the past. Is that an inflammatory response? What do you think? That makes sense. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really, I mean, I, I, I listed the symptoms, but that doesn't mean I, I know the mechanisms of all of them. I think I think uh, inflammation is a reasonable guess. Yes, I don't see any other questions here for you, Ben. You did a great job covering this topic. Loved your presentation. It was uh, really a great presentation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, okay. let's, so, so Ben, we look forward to uh, having you again in the future. And thanks for celebrating Bedford Day with us today, May twelfth. Okay, and uh, I'd like to invite you all to join us again for our regular monthly service. This month is going to be the fourth Thursday of January. Our Zoom party will begin at 6 p.m. Eastern time and the live stream at 7 p.m. Eastern time on January 27th. Lincoln Cannon will be our speaker. Lincoln is the founder of the Mormon Transhumanist Association and the Christian Transhumanist Association the world's largest advocacy networks for ethical use of technology and religion to enhance human abilities. We are looking forward to having Lincoln Cannon 
speaking at our event this fourth Thursday in January, January the 27th. And those of you who are in the live stream, you can also join our Zoom talks. If you'd like to join our Zoom party, it's before the event, you can do either, but that's always available to you if you'd like to register for that at the upper part of our website, there's the registration area and you can register for our Zoom party. If you don't wanna do that, you're always welcome to join just the live stream. Thank you for attending and for celebrating Bedford Day with us today. And we'll see you again soon. It's called Forever Young. May the good Lord be with you down every road and road. And may sunshine and happiness surround you when you're far from home. And may you grow to be proud, dignified and true. And do unto others as you'd have done to you. And be brave, and in my heart you'll always stay forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young. May good fortune be with you, may your guiding light be strong. Build a stairway to heaven with a prince or a vagabond. in vain and in my heart you will remain forever young forever young forever young forever young forever young forever young Right behind you, win or lose, forever young.